Good afternoon, uh, all, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the um, uh, Metro Fire Board of Directors uh, regular meeting. Uh, it's Thursday, June 22nd, it's 6 p.m. Uh, we're holding this meeting at uh, Fire Station 68 on uh, 12065 Cobblebrook Drive in Rancho Cordova. Uh, I'd like to call the meeting to order. Uh, Madam Clerk, would you do the roll call, please? Yes. <laughs> <That's closer. laughs> Director Weber? Present. Director Sheets? Present. Director Wood? Present. Director Rice? Present. Director Jones? Here. Director Costa? Here. Director uh, President Clark? Uh, present. And for the record, uh, Directors uh, Saylor and Gould are absent this evening. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, next, we uh, like to do our pledge uh, to our flag. Yeah. Director uh, Weber, can you lead us in the pledge? Yes. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Director. <laughs> Next, we have a Metro Cable announcement. This meeting of the Sacramento Metropolitan Fire District will be cable, cable cast on Metro Cable 14, the Local Government Affairs Channel on Comcast, Consolidated Communications, and AT&T U-verse cable systems. This meeting is also webcast at metro14live.saccounty.gov. And today's meeting replays on Monday, June 26, 20, 2023 at 6 p.m. and Wednesday, June 28th at 2 p.m. on Channel 14. This meeting can also be viewed at youtube.com forward slash Metro Cable 14. Next, we have public opportunity to discuss matters of public interest within district jurisdiction, including items on or not on the agenda. Do we have any speakers? She's over there this time. She's over there this time. Yeah. I have not received any speaker cards. But Art will be checking the Zoom. Right. Zoom attendees, you now have the opportunity to speak to the board members. If you have, if you like to raise your hand, I will give you an opportunity to uh, talk. No response. Hearing none, we move on to consent items. Uh, we have. Oh. Oh. All right, and that in a little interruption. There'll be more. <laughs> Pardon the interruption, we're in a fire station. Uh, we have uh, seven consent items on the, uh, on the agenda, and uh, you've had an opportunity to Look them over. Uh, do we have any questions? No. We haven't. Mr. Yes. Chair, I'll move the consent. I'll second. All right. We have a, a motion by Director Wood and a second by Director Rice. Madam um, Clerk, would you call the yes? The roll, Director please. Weber. Aye. Director Sheets. Aye. Director Wood. Aye. Director Rice. Aye. Director Jones. Aye. Director Costa. Aye. President Clerk. Aye. Thank you. Motion passes. All right. Next, we move on to presentation items. The first, uh, the only presentation item that we have is a uh, presentation of fee schedule for operational permits, plan reviews, uh, review uh, new construction inspections, general fire and life safety inspections, and that will be Assistant Chief Law. The recommendation is to uh, receive the presentation and prepare for public hearing on the 13th of July, 2023. Because we have a lot of 
So, good evening, directors. I'm Barbie Law. I am the fire marshal. With me tonight, I have Deputy Fire Marshal Amy Nyren and MBS Consulting Lauren uh, Lauren Guido and Nicole Kissam. Um, and we're here tonight to go over the fee study update. Um, we're going to be doing this as a presentation item to make you uh, aware of the content, and then we'll be coming back in July for public hearings. Tonight I am looking for some policy direction from the board as to what direction you would like to see us go in the appropriate amount of cost recovery for these services. Um, so one thing before I turn it over to NBS I think that's important to know is that we have not updated our fee schedule um, and done a full analysis since 2015. So we had or ordinance 2015-2 was the last time the schedule was fully analyzed and updated. And then in 2016, we did have a resolution to adopt a 2.6% CPI, um, and that was supposed to be done annually thereafter, but that has not occurred. So we haven't really updated since 2016. Um, since that time, we've actually adopted, adopted three revisions to the fire code, so the 2016, 19, and 2022 fire code. And every time we have an update to the fire code, that brings new inspection and permitting requirements typically, as well as the need to um, delete some things because services change based on the changes in the law. Um, another item of importance to note is that in 2018, SB 1205 took effect. Um, which increased our mandated inspections from um, just schools, public and private schools, to now include all hotels, motels, lodging houses, and apartments. So that represented a significant increase in workload that we are required to provide by law. Um, and then obviously we all know that our costs for labor and expenses and supplies and services and training have gone up significantly since 2015 related to um, inflation and the ramifications of a global pandemic that we all experienced. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to NBS to go over the study with you. And then we'll be here to take any questions that you have after that. Good evening, directors. Thank you for allowing us to be here with you this evening. We have put together a brief presentation just to kind of talk about the overall project goals and project approach that we took with this um, fee study, and then we'll look at the summary of results, and we'll also open it up at the end for any questions that you may have. So to start us off, really the, the main project goals in any time we do a fee study is first to understand the full cost of providing the services. And we'll talk a little bit more about what goes into understanding and kind of calculating those total costs. Once we have an understanding of those total costs, then we're able to kind of move on to step number two, which is helping our agencies set their fees accordingly. The project scope that we focused on was only looking really at cost recovery opportunities and revenues that would be something that would be solely adopted by the board. So we weren't looking at any type of taxes, fines, development, impact fees, et cetera. We're really just looking at fee generated revenue. And a lot of that is based on California Constitution is kind of the overarching authority for our fees. So Proposition 26 amended the California Constitution to provide further clarification for when a revenue is considered a tax versus when it's considered a fee. And so there are seven stated exceptions in Article 13C of the California Constitution that states that a, a revenue generating source is considered a fee as long as it meets one of these exceptions. Exception number three is for inspections and regulatory permits, and essentially the, the, the way that it reads is that inspections and regulatory permits are exempt from being considered a tax, however, they are still limited to the local government's um, reasonable costs. And then we see that kind of same concept of reasonable cost con you know, in all different forms of government code. You'll see here health and safety code also states that the district board may, can, may charge a fee to cover the cost of any service that the district provides. However, no fee shall exceed the cost reasonably borne by the district. So again, that goes back to kind of our first goal in the project is to understand what the total costs are so that we can kind of use that as our, our baseline. And so to do that, we use an industry standard approach that's been around for decades. And essentially, we start by gathering pieces of information. So we collect some data from the agency. We take a look at the existing fee schedule to look at not only how fees are charged, but if there's any um, opportunities there to charge fees differently or add fees based on um, changes in, as you know, um, Chief Law mentioned, changes in the code and things like that that may be missing from the fee schedule. 
Um, and then we start looking at the costs on three different ways. We look at costs on an annual basis, we look at costs on an hourly basis, and then we also look at costs on a per unit basis. And once we really understand all of those costs, we're then at that kind of, that next step, that next goal of what we're doing here today is looking at the cost recovery outcomes and fee setting policy. So some of the data that we collected was we took a look at the adopted budget and staffing. So the, the fee study that we have kind of put together was based on mid-year fiscal year 23's budget, adopted budget. Um, we look at workload from a, a previous completed fiscal year. So really what we're looking for is how many of each fee service is provided on an annual basis. And that helps us kind of not only look at what revenues are being generated today, but help project revenue in the future. We look at time estimates, both on an annual basis and on a per fee item. And then we also, again, look at the current fee schedule. Once we kind of have our baseline of all of the information, we then start to go into our cost estimation and our cost calculation um, criteria. So when we're looking at costs on an annual basis, we're looking for a couple of different things. We're looking for not only the direct costs, things like salaries and benefits and services and supplies, so your general operating expenditures, but we're also looking for anywhere that there may be indirect costs, things that are division, district-wide, um, department-wide, overhead costs, support services that should be eligible for recovery as well. So we kind of take a look at all of those costs and that gives us our baseline. Once we have all of those costs calculated, we're then able to divide those costs by the total hours that are available for staff to provide services, and that helps us determine what the hourly rate or the hourly cost analysis would be. So we have a couple of different hourly rates that were calculated through the fee study itself. The one that we focus most on that the majority of the fees are based on is the inspection and permit services, and that came out to about $304 an hour. So that's kind of our baseline of now that we've got all of our total costs, we've got our costs on an hourly basis. Now we go into more of a fee by fee or what we call like a per unit cost analysis where we essentially say we, we work with staff to understand how long it takes to provide each service that's on the fee schedule. We multiply that by the hourly rate that we've calculated and that determines what would be considered the 100% maximum fee amount that would be um, eligible to be charged. So once we have that information, we can then kind of move into that second, um, that second goal of kind of helping to look at how do we then set fees? Do we set them at 100% cost recovery or less? So one of the things that we always look at is that there's always generally um, some fees that you'll find that are going to be recovering 100% of their costs. But there's going to be a, a, many fees that are also not recovering 100% of their costs, and there may even be some fees that are currently over recovering their costs. So essentially what we're here tonight to kind of talk about is to kind of show you guys what the results of the analysis were. Um, as Chief Law mentioned, the fees haven't been looked at in, you know, since 2015, 2016. So there's a lot of areas where right now where you see that red arrow, that may be something that could be potentially generally general fund subsidies that are being provided. And so what we want to understand is, or help you guys understand is what is that subsidy looking like today and how much of that funding gap do you want to close by increasing your fee generated revenue? So we put together a report, so I know everybody had their staff report today, and so NBS puts together a report, and part of that report is there's a couple of, of appendices that essentially kind of show the fee tables and some of the different information. In Appendix A is where you're going to see the results of the fee study. So there's a couple of different columns that will really help you kind of hone in on some of these concepts. Um, you're going to see a column that's labeled cost of service per activity, and so that column represents that 100% cost recovery level. Um, that maximum fee amount, if you will. So that's kind of where we're looking at that. And then when you compare that to the existing cost recovery percentage, what we're trying to compare there is what is this, the actual cost recovery today at the current fee amount compared to that 100% cost recovery amount. So that'll help you see where some fees you'll see will be less than 100%, some may be over 100%, and you know some will be right around 100%. So that's gonna help you on a fee by fee basis really understand kind of where the fees are currently landing. Um, there is also an Appendix B that has a comparative fee survey. Um, so we did look at some surrounding agencies. We will talk about some of the caveats with that. So if you do look in the report, Appendix B is that comparative survey. So to kind of give you guys an idea of where the results came out, currently right now the district is recovering about 45% of the total annual cost of providing services. So when we look at the totals, right now it's about 2.5 million versus about 5.7 million that could be eligible for recovery through fees. So again, that's kind of that red arrow funding gap of how much of that do you guys want to close by increasing um, fee amounts to try and close that 45% that to 100% gap. 
Um, so should the board adopt all of the fees at 100% cost recovery, that would bring in an additional 3.2 million in fee revenue. Um, but there may be reasons why fees wouldn't necessarily be adopted at 100% cost recovery. So we'll let Chief Law um, talk more about some of those areas where you guys may want to consider less than 100% cost recovery, but we did want to kind of present the results at least to give you guys an idea of overall where fees are at. Um, again, to talk about the comparison survey, just kind of briefly, we did look at um, several different agencies. So we looked at Contra Costa County, Consumeness, Fresno, Orange County, and the City of Sacramento's fees. A couple of things to understand with the, the comparative results is that there's not always a good one-for-one -one, um, way of knowing exactly how much another agency is charging for their fees. Sometimes they have varied terminology for a similar service or they don't have something published on their fee schedule and so really we're only able to gather what is publicly available um, out on their websites. Um, also just understanding, you know, when was the last time they looked at their fees? We don't really have a good understanding of when was the last time they looked at their fees or what was their cost recovery policy? Are they trying to collect 100% cost recovery or are they somewhere less? So keep that in mind that if you are looking at the comparative survey as a benchmarking tool to understand you know, or where you guys want to set um, your fees, it's just something to kind of consider that we don't always necessarily have apples to apples with some of the comparison information. So as Chief Law mentioned, we're here today just kind of at least presenting the information, giving you guys an opportunity to ask questions about the study itself if you have any um, specific questions. There will be some adoption hearings that take place in July, and then fees will become effective 60 days after they are officially adopted. Mm -hmm. um, and that is what we had for you this evening, so thank you so much for your time, and I will turn it back over to Chief Law. Um, when we talk about benchmarking and uh, the fees and looking at other agencies, I think the one area that we really are going to be looking for some direction from the board on is in the collection of fees for school inspections. The last time we adopted an ordinance, uh, we were not mandated to uh, inspect the schools and that has changed since then. In 2018, now we are able to recover the cost of school inspections. We are currently, although you may not see it in that attachment B, um, surrounding agency, our surrounding agencies are recovering the cost of school inspections. Um, and you'll look at the um, workload on our schools. Those are dependent on the size of the school. We spend a lot of hours and time in that. Right now, the district, our current policy is to recover costs for private schools. We have not been recovering the costs for public schools, which is definitely the larger proportion of the workload that we do. So we would be looking at requesting and phasing in uh, next fiscal year, so July 1 of 2024, to give the school districts the time to um, adjust their budgets if necessary, but looking to recover the costs for the schools, and we've changed how we would look at that by the size of the school, the student population, which directly relates to how long it takes us to complete that um, inspection. So I think, of, um, I think that's going to be the largest, largest change that we're looking for in here. Um, I, as the head of the division, am definitely strongly advocating to get us to a point where we are recovering 100% of the cost of doing services. This board has always had a goal of doing 100% business inspections to help the community out. We have not been able to get towards that benchmark, especially when we had the new mandates come into place. Right now, we're really able to cover our mandates um, and, uh, and complaints that come in. And those complaints come in from both our fire fire crews, um, as well as the community um, in regards to unsafe conditions that may, de may be there. So we still need to get to a point that where we're funded in a way that we have inspectors that can also go out and start getting out into our business community to make things safer for everyone. As we all know, when we have a fire in a business, over 80% of businesses never reopen again, which is an impact in the community that makes it you know, not sustainable and viable for, for business. So that's really what I'm going to be looking for. Um, and with that, I can take any questions that you have and, and hear your um, perspective and feedback on where you'd like to be. Okay, we, we have a couple of questions. Director uh, Rice, could go ahead, please. Chief Law, uh, you, had, you answered almost all of them, and I, I am with you. We should be trying to do 100% cost recovery. Um, There's so many challenges to the budget and so many um, additional demands on service that we, we've certainly exceeded what our revenue stream is when it was made. So I fully support that. The second one was on the cost analysis. Um, 
did we did we do a cost analysis to the depth of um, go back, going back 15 years when we we did an, an audit of medic units for GEMT and we included everything in there as part of that cost is our analysis that deep and if it's not I think we should because we're selling ourselves short and it would also give you some flexibility and some room to move um, when it comes to the value and being able to um, um, have consideration for different business types but I, if we haven't done it that thoroughly I would that would be a and ask of me, consider it. Yeah, um, that's a good question. I will tell you that the district has been working with NBS since the early 2000s on all of our fee studies, so they have all of the historical knowledge already. And uh, myself and my staff, I locked them all in a room, and we literally went line by line by line through every fee that we are currently charging with a deep dive analysis on how long it actually takes us to provide that service. I think when we looked at some of our previous fee schedules, there wasn't as strong of an understanding of all the things that needed to be taken into consideration. Um, it's not just the amount of time it takes us to walk in the building and do the inspection. It's the amount of time that it takes to do that plan review for us to get to the inspection. We also have re-inspections that we're doing. There's administrative staff time in assigning these, these inspections, maintaining the software programs that we use to track all of this. Vehicles to travel to and from yes. all of it. It sounds like you guys have done that. Thank you. Yes. Um, last one. Do you have anything that you guys want to add on that? Or? That's great. Let's have any more questions. L last one is, is in community risk reduction, and I don't even know if there is one, but as far as fee or cost, I look at it as cost recovery. Mm -hmm. Is there an industry standard or at least a regional standard? And if there is, do we find ourselves at the standard or above or below? Are, are we antiquated in our, our structuring and our recovery? I'll let, I'll let the expert answer. Uh -huh. um, so there's different... There are some general standards, but of course, you guys are a larger fire district in the state. So um, I think whatever policy you adopt really needs to be specific to how you guys are doing business. But in general, there are a couple different types of services provided in a fire prevention fee program or community risk reduction program. You've got regulation of your existing businesses and facilities. Um, and if there's going to be a subsidy provided anywhere, it would be in that list for schools or um, for existing businesses, depending on how you look at that. Um, then you have the development side, which is all of the sprinklers, alarms, new construction, all the regulation on that end. And that's typically an area of the fee schedule where there is not a subsidy provided, just based on the span of public to private benefit of those services, right? Obviously, the safety regulations on the existing businesses have a different policy consideration, potentially, than, than the development services. And another common approach is to phase in increases sometimes if they're, if they're looking a little bit higher than usual. Thank you. Sure. Director Weber, you had a question. Yes. Well, real quick, yeah. absolutely support you getting to 100%. I'd like to see you get to as close to as possible as cost neutral on that. The question I have, though, is the, the challenge with the reinspections. Okay, I get one or two reinspections, but is there any uh, assessment, a fee, a, a penalty when we're getting into three, four, five, six times we're going back? And what is that? Can you explain that to us? So if you look in our the miscellaneous section of the fee schedule, so a typical inspection will um, include the initial inspection, the plan review, and one reinspection. Okay. And then that miscellaneous fee schedule previously provided for, I believe it was somewhere in the $400 range for additional inspections after that. Um, and our inspectors, sometimes it's really, there's just a couple more things they've been working with us, so they're hesitant to charge such an exorbitant fee for something. Um, so we've restructured what that's going to look at, uh, look like to just charge by, you know, by the half hour when we're having, when we're having to go out again. So it's a little more in alignment with the, the actual time that's spent on those. Um, so if they're going out and they're having to take four hours for another extensive inspection, then that would be charged accordingly. Um, but I th like I said, in, in the past, I think the, the cost was such that people weren't really marking it down, so we weren't recovering those costs. Right. Okay, thank you. Thank you sir. Any other questions? I, I've, I've got yes, a question. Well, thank you. Um, 
So I, I want to make sure I understood the, the comparative component. So we compared some jurisdictions. And what I heard was the caveats to that. But why did we choose these particular jurisdictions? Uh, because they're comparable in size and agency and scope of services and they're, they're local in our region or they're similar um, special districts in the, in the Bay Area. One thing to note, at the time that the, the, that information was pulled, since then some of those agencies have actually gone through another fee revision. Um, and uh, like Lauren covered, everybody isn't on the same cycle. We don't know when they did stuff, but I do know that Kasumnis just redid their fee schedule. So that isn't incorporated in there. Um, I know that the city of Sacramento, I think, is showing not recovering costs on schools, but, but that's been updated. So it gets really challenging mm -hmm. um, because of all the differences and how, and how everybody captures their stuff in their work cycles and when, they, and when they update to make it really an apples to apples comparison. So we have information, but I wouldn't say that it's necessarily um, complete across the board. And at the end of the day, our costs to provide the service are our costs to, pro to provide the service. And we need to be looking at that and keeping that in consideration, I think. Mm -hmm. And then a decision was made prior to be at, I think it said 45%, or we're, we're currently collecting at 45%. That's just currently what, that wasn't a decision, that just is where we are. That's with, where we with, are currently. With, that's where okay. we are currently with mm -hmm. the fees as they are. Okay. We're, doing, we're doing the best in the miscellaneous section. The other two sections that we looked at were really under recovering our costs because the costs have gone up significantly. And as we talked about before, not really sure if we truly understood the time capacity that we were supposed to look at. MBS did a great job of educating myself and my staff as we're all coming into new positions. And I, I mean, we really spent the time and energy to put in and account for everything that it goes into to providing these services in the community. So just sorry, I, I just want to follow back up. So you mentioned the CSD and then the city has recently done an update. Um, I think it'd be helpful just to know what that change was because I think it would have an impact to what we're trying to accomplish. Um, I mean, fully support recovering costs, but I just want to make sure we are as close as we can be or we're comparing as close as we can be. And then a follow-up to that, <clears throat> between now and when it comes back to the board, are there groups that we would go to to talk that may be impacted by these fees yes. and seek their feedback? Okay. Yes, so we have a, a whole list of people. We always do outreach to our various chambers of commerce. Okay. Obviously, the school districts will have to be notified. We would reach out to the hospital council. We have two hospitals in our, in our jurisdiction. I would say CALA. I looked at the list, and I think there's um, some more outreach that we can do. That public noticing will go out, and I will work with Marnie to get um, you know contact for everyone so they've got access to the information and can be here to express their their feedback and what they would like to see. Okay, so between now and then, we'll, we'll yes. be reaching out to those groups. Great. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. so, uh, but between now and July, right, we would have all that. Okay. We would be looking to have that first public hearing on July 13th, Perfect. and the second hearing would be your second meeting. Perfect. So we, in between those two hearings, if we get significant um, public input, and, you know, that we need to make some changes, that, mm -hmm. that would happen quickly in between those two meetings. We would re-publicly notice again any changes and then have that discussion mm -hmm. with the goal of, of um, implementing the new fee schedule September 1. Mm -hmm. um, we will need some staff time to actually update the software programs to get all of the new information once we've sorted out what that's going to be. Right. I just have one quick one. We, we have another quick question. Did, for can you notify us on uh, E email, phone, something on the hearing dates of that. I don't remember the rest of the board, but I'm interested in that. Oh, it's your board meetings, your next, oh, okay. your, your July okay. board meetings, July 13 and yes. 27. Very the good. Dates. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Here in, uh, we you. have another question by Director Jones. Right. Yeah. A, a couple of follow up uh, things here. My, my overall view is I, I really want to make sure that the small ma and pa business fronts are not um, overly impacted by this. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not sure if that's like 5% of what we do or 20%. And I notice in here there's a breakdown and it's per square footage of the, of the one owner. Um, how do you handle or is there compliance when, let's say there are, in my district, for example, there's a section, there are 18 fronts, business fronts, and eight are vacant. What happens? Is the owner still charged for uh, fire safety 
issues there? So vacant businesses are not inspections, are, are not an, a routine inspection. They're retired in the system until we get an application or permits or, or you know, change of use and somebody's moving back in again. And again, remember, we're not able to get out to all businesses right now. We are largely focused on new construction mm -hmm. um, and then code enforcement complaints and our mandate inspections under SB 1205. I want to get to a point where we can provide those business inspections and safety information to 100% of our businesses, but we're not there yet, but that has always been your goal. Okay, well, I was just concerned about the overall fire safety for a commercial strip. If yeah. a chunk of those businesses are vacant, uh, you know, ne'er-do-wells, whatever you want to say, there, there's a lot of potential for um, um, public nuisance stuff going on. And we but do, we're not quite, we're not there yet because we don't yeah. have the staff. We don't, so I understand. We're not, we, the staff that we have right now, the number of personnel that we have is sufficient for us to keep up with the mandates and, and the complaints that come mm -hmm. in from both our fire crews and um, the community. I can tell you that we work closely with code enforcement when you're talking about nuisance properties. We do hear from business owners that are adjacent to, to um, businesses that may be having problems with our unhoused population breaking in or other problems. So we still do have that interaction and then we have the ability to work with the code enforcement and other partners mm -hmm. to identify the owner and get problems solved. But in regards to a regular inspection of a vacant business, mm -hmm. th that has not been a practice that at Metro Fire that we've had. Okay, so if I'm aware of since I've been here. Yes, ma'am. So uh, if I receive complaints or something, I, it's, it's the, the proper form is to f follow through with local code enforcement uh, not necessarily the fire jurisdiction. Yeah, it, it depends on okay. what the complaint is, but there's multiple partners that okay. we work with regularly. No, thank to you get very stuff much. Out to the just right place. moving on here, real quick, and I appreciate uh, the time. Um, I'm concerned about some size ranges. Okay. For example, on item number six, it talks about carnivals, fairs, and special events. And uh, is there any. Um, breakdown? You know, if you're going to, I see the outdoor assembly for a thousand people. Is there, is there any, that might be a, a point of, gradu, of gradual, of gradation, not gradation, but graduating fees depending on the size. Is there any subsection of six? Ben? Do you guys have that in front of you right now? If, it, if it's in the report somewhere, I'll find it. Just okay. tell me where to find it. Yes. And how it adds on every time. Oh, that's the that's additional booths. So then you, you have the policy that when this combines with other permits that they might need, that they're charged on a quarter hour for each additional. Right? Yeah. So so Director Jones, there is uh, you'd have to look in one of the footnotes. Um, so when we're talking about additional booths, we're talking about a large fair where you have a lot of vendors out. So you have the standard fee for that special event at nine hundred and thirteen dollars would be proposed. Once we get to a large outdoor event. We're, we're looking at sometimes ha being required to actually have staff on scene the whole time. There's more plan review. It takes, it takes longer to do, so that's why that charge is higher. Um, and then we also, if there's different permits that need to be um, pulled within a specific event, there's a, a different charge, and it's in the footnotes. I don't, I don't have it. Okay, so right now, give me a number. A hour. Give me a number of booths that are included in the 900 fee. Oh, Amy, none. No. There's no, there's no booths included in. Well, that's in, the starting point. That's the starting point. And so point. that addition so takes care event, of the larger and larger and then, events. Yes. Got it. Sorry. Thank you. No, no, mentioned. that's, uh, thank you very much for that. And then, uh, cover, again, the range business, covered in open mall buildings. Um, I mean, we could have a, you know, a small one versus a super large one. Is there any? We might be able to go easier on the small ones and perhaps the large ones. Is there any inc incremental charge for those larger ones? That no, might be something right now, to look at. Right now, what you see here is what is in your existing fee schedule. There mm -hmm. is no breakdown um, currently, and that is not what we were looking at now. We could take a look at that and see how other agencies are handling that if we can find an apples to apples comparison. Yeah, well, there's a difference. It's not an argument, but you know, between Roseville Mall and then the Sprouts Market down here. So, yeah. I mean, okay, no, thank you. I just wanted to draw that that there might be areas maybe, for. I can 
can answer that. So the covered mall is going to be like your Sunrise Mall or yeah. your Country Club Plaza. When you look at your smaller, like your strip mall, that would not be covered under that. That's going to be based on the individual business at that point. All right. Well, I'll get online with I'm just curious how many we have, and I'll, I'll talk with you guys sure. offline. I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, just a couple more. Number 38, <gasps> open flames and candles from zero to 456. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure how to address that. How much open flame? Yeah, again, it's a great, or perhaps I could follow off uh, follow up offline, but again, it's the, it's the gradual increase in potential harm that I, I want, it would be nice if we could address that a little bit, but I'll get to you off now. Um, sorry. For public schools, who pays? It would be the school district. The school district? Yes. Okay. And uh, 38, that was the size range. Okay. Um, is it worth analyzing? Is it productive to analyze why we stopped, we only did the 2.6% once? I couldn't, I, I can ask, but most of the people that were here, the, that whole leadership team is not here anymore, so it would be difficult for okay. me to get the not answers productive. on why that didn't occur. We are recommending that in the future, every July 1, we take a look at that, and Amy and I will be committed to making sure that happens so we don't get this far behind in the future. Right. Now, will that type of CPI increase be included in the final thing that we vote on yes. at the end of July? Yes, it is. Thank you, Chief. Mm -hmm. Are you, you're good? Thank you, Mr. Oh, Chair. Okay, yes. thank you, Director. Uh, hearing no further questions, uh, thank you very much. It's a great presentation, uh, NDS. Thank you as well, uh, Chief uh, Law. Thank you. All right. Oh, let me not take the quick so Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Let's move on to our action items. The first action item that we have is our MIH contract with Sacramento County, and that'll be Italian Chief Scott Perryman. And the recommendation is to adopt the resolution and authorize the fire chief or his designee to enter into a contract, into a contract with the uh, services requested by Sacramento County. Good evening, Board of Directors. Chief Haverty, thank you for having me tonight. I come to you tonight with a uh, with good news, good news, problem, and a solution. <laughs> so let's start off with the good news. The good news is mobile integrated health is going strong. In fact, we're on track to double the call volume that we did last year. So we're seeing a dramatic increase in our use, which means we have more and more stories of value that we're bringing to our Metro Fire uh, citizens here. The other good news is we're looking to expand into telemedicine and we're looking to expand into covering more days of the week to again bring more value to our individuals that we serve here. Mm -hmm. Now on to the problem. The problem is, is the original funding that we were given is running out very quickly. In fact, uh, we thought it was going to last a year. We've made it last a year and a half. That year and a half ends at the end of this month. So that is the problem. We're out of funding. The good news, and also the solution, is Sacramento County is wanting to contract services with Metro Fire to continue our mobile integrated health program for an additional six months. This funding will allow us to actually expand to full coverage of seven days a week, and also it covers all of the costs for Metro Fire, so it's no expense from our general fund. Again, this is a contract for services for an additional six months which will buy us the time that we desperately need to get the contracts in play where we can actually recover costs for our services. We're very excited about this because it puts us in line with, um, well, what everybody else is doing throughout the rest of the country. We're hearing more and more individuals that are starting similar programs, and we're excited to see this move forward. So our recommendation is that uh, you authorize the fire chief or his designee to enter into a contract for services requested by Sacramento County. Right. I'm ready for questions. Metro Fire leading the way. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Do we have any questions? Hearing none, thank you. Uh, well, we, we got to Go vote it. on this. Okay. Uh, hearing none, uh, I, I, I'll entertain a motion. I'll so move steps. And I'll okay. be glad to second. Okay. Oh, I don't know yeah. <laughs> a motion by <laughs> Director Wood, a second by Director Rice. <laughs> and. Uh, we'll do a roll call. Yes. Director oh. Weber? Aye. Director Sheets? Aye. 
Director Wood? Aye. Director Rice? Aye. Director Jones? Aye. Director Costa? Aye. President Clark? Aye. Thank you, motion passes. Thank you, Chief Baird. Good job. Uh, second uh, act, um, item on the uh, action item is to nominate one board member for special district representative seat number seven to Sacramento LAFCO Special Districts Committee. Uh, and uh, the recommendation is to consider not nominating one board member to Sacramento LAFCO Special District Committee. Um, Director uh, Jones, would you, you're a member of LAFCO. We already have a seat on LAFCO. Yes, so sir. That, yes, sir. That is it? that is true, Mr. President. Mm -hmm. Our uh, uh, again, this is a courtesy notice sent out to all special districts in Sacramento County. Uh, Metro is represented by myself on the uh, second uh, special district seat, and it would uh, I would just say to thank you for to LAFCO for sending us uh, the information, and it's a uh, it's a courtesy notice. I don't believe there's any action needed. Mm. I don't believe that either. Okay. All right. Well, that completes the uh, action items. Uh, next, we go to reports. Uh, President reports. I have none. Uh, Fire Chief's report. We have Aaron Chief Liberty. What's he? Thank you, President Clark, uh, esteemed colleagues on the board, and uh, my fellow members of the department. Uh, tonight, we. Uh, would like to welcome in some new hires. Uh, Jeffrey Sargent, was hired as a fire investigator two, effective June 12th. Caitlin Roberts, hired as an office technician in CRRD, effective June 12th. And uh, we have some new reserve firefighters, which is kind of cool. Uh, Shane Boone, Romeo Cha, Sergio Rodriguez, and Noah Wilson. Um, those. Um, Reserve firefighters joined us on June 10th. And our Human Resources Division is accepting applications for career development opportunity as a day assignment for MIH um, to work with Battalion Chief Perriman and others. Um, the final filing date for that is June 29th at 4 p.m. And um, our Human Resources and many others in the department worked so hard on um, preparing candidates to take the battalion chief's um, assessments and, and an exam. And I uh, am delighted to announce that we have a list of 19 um, candidates for the job of battalion chief into the future. So that's a great, a great list to have for the department. And I think the list that long shows um, the wonderful work on behalf of not only those members who worked diligently and um, over many months to prepare themselves, but also, also those who mentored them at the station level, at the battalion level, at the AC level and beyond. So they did a good job. As you are aware, we have a long weekend ahead of us. So we have uh, two special board meetings this weekend for the fire chief interviews at our headquarters building. Saturday begins at 8 a.m and uh, Sunday begins at 1 p.m. Um, Saturday will go all day, and Sunday I would plan on your time being there until 5.30 or so, we'll see how it goes. And uh, this week um, we had a couple of sessions of reframing organizations, so we're finally into our fourth frame, the symbolic frame, and that's going well. There are two sessions scheduled uh, left, two sets of sessions in um, uh, July and August on leadership. And uh, I was uh, honored to represent the department uh, at the celebration of life for Battalion Chief John French. Uh, Chief French retired in 1990 from the American River Fire District. He began his career with the Arden Fire Department. When I was there, there were over 30 retired firefighters present including Director Rice and his wife Liz, as well as a Metro Engine Company under Battalion Chief Reed's command. Um, and I had a chance to speak with his wife, Carol, a few days ago, and she was just so appreciative of the turnout from Metro Fire. She also spoke of the time when John had his first seizure out in uh, Lincoln. He was transported to a hospital in um, Roseville and uh, Metro Fire was there with them, just standing by, ready to assist any, in any way possible. 
And although that was a number of years ago, it had a tr dramatic impact on the family and Carol herself. So I don't know who those members were, but they know who they are. And I'd just like to thank them on behalf of Carol and her children. So that concludes my report, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Do we have any questions from the Chief? Okay. All right. Next, we go with uh, administrative operations report, and that would be uh, Deputy Chief Mitchell. Thank you, President Clark. Good evening, directors, Chief Haverty, and everybody here in the audience and virtually. Um, Deputy Chief Adam Mitchell, a couple updates for you from operations. First off, starting with the vegetation management burn update. Um, the Ilya Call and Preserve at Mather Vegetation Management burns, we just completed those recently. The burns were conducted across all three shifts, A, B, and C shift, between June 9th and June 16th. Those were communicated to the public. Um, for awareness, a total of 355 acres were treated, and we collaborated with Sacramento County Parks, Center for Natural Lands Management, and the Metro Fire Community Wildfire Preparedness Plan. Um, the burns were really intended to restore the role of fire on the landscape which helps us treat for noxious and invasive plants across that area, and then also reducing the wildfire threat across the community of Mather, just because we're removing the fuel before we have an issue out in those areas. Um, and it also uh, resulted in some really, really good training for our, um, our members that were out there. So I'd just like to say thank you to everybody involved, our collaboration, other agencies, and everybody that was involved in putting that training together. Secondly, um, Congressman Barra um, visited us on Friday, June 9th. Um, a number of staff facilitated that visit um, and his staff at the Zinfandel Training Center to discuss the history, current use, and future plans for that area. Thank you to some of the directors that were there that day. Um, it was well attended. Specifically, the congressman um, is moving forward with supporting a federal earmark to develop the EVOC portion of the Training Center project, which is good news for us. Um, he's a good friend of the district. Um, special thanks go out to Kyle McDonald, Aaron Castleberry, Chief Mike Lozano is here, um, Battalion Chief Brian Gonzalez um, for their portions of the presentation and coordination for the visit. Also Chief House attended, so appreciate um, a good show for Metro Fire to be there. Um, we also were welcoming Sheriff Jim Cooper, the Sacramento Sheriff's Department Captain of Training, Matt Tamayo and Pat Ellis from PG&E um, that recognizes support across our regional partners, both public and private for the project. And although not able to make it that day, I do appreciate the support um, that I got a phone call from the Citrus Heights Police Chief, Alex Turcott, for the project as well, because they are very interested in partnering with us on that. So the presentation by the Congressman and his staff was well received, and we will continue to work with him on his staff moving forward through this process, fingers crossed there. Another one um, really is a cross branch uh, item. It's the capital assets inventory process. Um, recently, the district finance staff completed that biannual capital asset inventory. And I just, operations received an email titled capital asset inventory, a big thank you from Marie Jones in finance. And it said, with the addition of another finance team, three teams instead of two, meeting with our operations team and getting the word out prior to us coming, this was by far the smoothest and quickest inventory we had. And I can say that as I've led every capital asset inventory the district has ever done. Normally we use about two weeks to complete all the counts and this year we completed it in just three and a half days. So that's really cool, um, but I just wanted to say this efficiency would not have been possible without that coordination. And I wanted to specifically thank Marie, Dave, and the whole finance team, my Chief Bailey's here too, um, for their work and their early communication by reaching out to us in operations and allowed us to set that new record. I think that's a really great example of teamwork that we have here at Metro Fire and I'm across the divisions and branches. So thank you to them. And then finally tonight on the service delivery uh, transition plan update, I'm happy to report that we held a joint planning meeting um, this past Tuesday on June 20th and we're continuing to make progress towards implementation of the FDM to MMP transition that you all gave direction for us to um, do, that incremental transition plan. Currently, I'm happy to announce the target date for deployment of phase one, which includes four FDMs to MMPs, is Sunday, September 3rd. We were able to sit down and talk, a large group, including I would like to say thank you to 522. Their representation there was great. BP Cole was there. Um, keeping that project moving forward to support the, support the service delivery to the, to the rest of our community as well as our own members. When that, I conclude the operations report. Thank Very you. good. Do we have any questions of the chief? No. Thank you, chief. Next, we have an administrative report from uh, Deputy Chief Bailey. Good evening, board of directors, board chair, 
Chief Haverty, members in, uh, of the community, and from Metro Fire that are here tonight. Uh, quick update. Community Relations Division's been hard at work uh, preparing for 4th of July. So they're working with CRD on fireworks project, helping distribute the fireworks safety me messages. There's, uh, I believe, 150 engine decals, decals throughout the district. TNT fireworks booth safety message. There's been 400 flyers distributed and 154 TNT booths throughout the district have those posted at uh, each site. There's been a video collaboration with Citrus Heights. Also, Metro Fireworks safety video went out. There's been several media segments. Uh, PIO has these planned as we get closer to the 4th of July weekend and also education enforcement through the fireworks task force. Uh, there's been a request to distribute our fireworks safety message throughout our entire communities, including uh, the city of Citrus Heights, Rancho Cordova, San Juan Unified School District, uh, Sacramento Office of Education, Carmichael Chamber, North Highlands Community Services, Ferrix Rec uh, Recreation and Park District, uh, local news and uh, newspapers, Safe Kids Coordinator, and Metro Fire Social Media. Also, uh, direct communication with the San Juan Unified School District and the Sacramento City Unified School District. Uh, again, thanks to Finance for completing the biennial capital assets inventory. Thanks for everyone that was involved in that process. HR, uh, we have one logistic technician that starts on June 27th. One office tech that's currently in backgrounds. They had interviews today for the administrative specialist. We have two vacancies for that position. And then again, congratulations to everyone, all 19 candidates that passed the BC test. You know, this process for many of them started possibly two years ago or even prior to. This is the largest list that I recall in my 20 year career. So. You know, typically you get in between five and 10 candidates that have, you know, 19 that were successful. And I heard that each of them were very closely, you know, very one or 2% difference from top of the list all the way to the bottom. So that's a great success. Mm -hmm. um, we have 14 uh, paramedics that are through background and 10 EMTs. And the Acad Academy start date for the MMPs will be July 10th. And then the last thing I just want to report to the board is I had it invite and I flew to San Diego. Uh, I, I attended the board meeting with Farah on June 12th and President Chris Bernard nominated me to fill a director seat and I was unanimously nominated or uh, elected to be on the position for two years. So I will be representing Metro Fire for the next two years uh, serving as a director for FAIR. And I think this is a great opportunity for us. And I knew that we had discussions about a possibility of this happening if we went with FAIR as our insurance carrier and they followed through and it did happen on June 12th. So, and that's the end of my report. Oversight. Thank, Thank you. you. We don't have any questions for Chief Bailey. Mm -hmm. Congratulations, Chief, on your board. To the board. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. And now uh, I think I understand that Chief Wagman, oh, oh you, you're gonna do Chief Wagman's? Okay, thank you. Yes, good evening, directors, Barbie Law, Fire Marshal. Uh, I'll be coming this, covering the support services report for uh, Chief Wagman tonight. Um, I have a couple of it, updates for you from our fire investigation unit and um, CRD last week. Um, Deputy Fire Marshal Amy Nyron and I were at the Board of Supervisors meeting doing a joint presentation with the Sacramento Sheriff's Office as well as Sacramento County Code Enforcement on the enforcement plan for fireworks season. Um, Chief Bailey covered a lot of the activities, but the presentation was very well received. I know we've had a lot of um, public interaction uh, with a group um, called Residents Against Illegal Fireworks, and we've been working closely with them. And I'm really pleased to say that they, they were happy with the efforts that we've made. I know they've had some frustration in, um, in previous years, um, and the actual comments and feedback to the Board of Supervisors when we were done was that they have never received such a comprehensive and detailed report from Metro Fire. Um, and so I think we really, our efforts have really um, alleviated some of the, the fears and concerns in the community 
community. Um, we have been working very closely with county code enforcement on as we receive complaints about fireworks use, making sure that the sheriff's department is aware to enhance controls, as well as county code enforcement sending out warning letters to those locations so that people are really getting the word out um, about the host liability ordinance that is in effect to year in the, uh, this year and the penalties that can occur from that. Um, second item, we did work yesterday. I just wanted to say thank you to Human Resources and Local 522 for sitting down with us to work through some of the staffing challenges that we're experiencing in the fire investigation unit. Um, unfortunately, the last meeting, we were very excited to welcome our new investigator who will be taking over on B-Shift next month. However, we've experienced another setback with two members having significant health issues that are not going to be able to work um, for, for a while is what we're anticipating. Um, so to end on a positive note, Inspector Krista Aney completed her law enforcement academy yesterday. Um, if you don't know Krista, Krista started in the single role paramedic program and worked for six years for us as a paramedic before transitioning and becoming a fire inspector. Um, and her ultimate goal is to become a fire investigator. So she has been putting herself through post. Um, she did experience some drawbacks during COVID. Her final class was canceled because of COVID. So I'm just couldn't be more proud of Krista for working her way through. And it's just another success story with our single role program and a different path. There's more opportunities than um, becoming a firefighter. Um, we actually are seeing uh, Krista step up and she will, effective next week, be able to start filling the role as an investigator run in one of the vacancies that we have for our investigator that um, is ill. Um, so that will help bridge some of the gap. Um, HR is expediting and working with us on getting her through her post background and to get her to a full investigator too. And myself and Amy and the rest of the CRD team could not be more proud of Krista. She has really put in the effort and is a quality individual and is going to do a great job for us. So that's my report. If you have any questions. All right. Thank you. Any questions? No. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Chief, once again. All right, finally, on the, uh, the reports, we get to uh, Local 522, <laughs> BC Matco. Welcome back. Thank you, and good evening. Um, we would also like to congratulate the 19 battalion chiefs, uh, coupled with uh, 22 successful company officer candidates. Um, those eligibility lists hopefully are going to yield some promotions here soon that will help us. Uh, ensure that we keep our companies fully staffed coming through the summer months. It will also give us the tools to work people out of class and give them experience as other promotional opportunities develop. Um, coupled with the, the meeting that Chief Mitchell spoke on on the deployment, we, we believe that there are a lot of factors uh, in front of us that are going to help us sort of stabilize some of the staffing challenges that we've been experiencing for a couple of years now. Um, we're not completely out of the woods but we are working together to um, come with solutions and get people in the right seats. As you've heard in multiple divisions, there are so many opportunities for promotion and advancement and people testing and recruitments. And so we have great people joining the organization. We have great people moving up within the organization. So it's, it's an exciting time. Um, and that brings us to the big recruitment as Chief Haverty had spoken to this weekend. Um, it's a big weekend. I want to personally thank you on behalf of all 522 members in all divisions and firehouses for the time that a number of you have taken over the last months and, and really over a year to connect with the membership um, to understand where the working men and women in Metro Fire sit. With this opportunity in front of us, um, we appreciate that you've taken some of your time to sit with us to hear that feedback because I don't think the value of the feedback of, of the men and women that make this place go can be overstated. So, Thank you very much for that time. Also, thank you for uh, putting together a panel configuration that allows for stakeholders to be involved and 522 is excited to be part of that this weekend. I know those are going to be long days. Saturday sounds like it's the longest on the schedule. Good news is there's a luau at the links immediately following that, which uh, is the Burn Institute's fundraiser out at Hagen Oaks from seven to 11. So for everybody in the audience, all of you and anybody watching at home, I believe there are still tickets available. It goes to a fantastic cause. Uh, there's fire dancers and singing and beverages and food. So please, uh, after a long day, come out and put your flip-flops on and do a little hula dance at the Luau at the Lynx. Um, and other than that, I'd just like to report that we do have a unit meeting also next week. 
June 30th, we'll be supporting a local business in Battalion 13, and we hope to have a lot of membership there just talking about all of the things that we collectively are working on. With that, concludes my report, unless you've got any questions. Do we have any questions for yeah. BC Cook? Thank you, man. Thank you. Appreciate you. All right. <clears throat> Next, we go on to uh, committee and delegate reports. Executive committee has to be determined. Communications, uh, Senator JPA, uh, DC Wagman, is anybody? Well, uh, the next meeting is at uh, June 27th at uh, 9 a.m., and they will report out at June 22nd, uh, 2023, from June 13th meeting. Finance and Audit Committee, Director Wood. Uh, yeah, the finance. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The Finance and Audit Committee has not met since we last met. It will meet again on July 27th at 5:30. Right. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, P Policy Committee, Director Costa. Thank you. Uh, nothing new to report. Our next meeting is to be determined. All right. Thank you so much. Next, we go to board uh, member questions and comments. We'll start with Director Weber. I have no comments. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Next, we go to Director Costa. Thank you. Um, just want to say thank you to, to everybody in the, in the division and for all the hard work and the preparation for 4th of July. And thank you for the opportunity to meet here at this beautiful station. Thank you. All right. Victor uh, Rice. I'd just like to take just a minute to remember um, Fire Captain Larry Swafford, who recently passed away. Um, for those of you that didn't know Larry, he was certainly an officer and a gentleman. His last assignment was Old Engine 10. Um, he was a fixture with Gary Gill as an engineer, and then Brian Cassidy, and then Tom Blount as a firefighter. And, uh, I remember one incident with Larry early, early in my career, riding an old arcade um, convertible grass rig. I think they're parade rigs now with Bob Souls and driving, and both Bob and Larry are past, but any members that are currently working in a fire station, men like that are who built this for you. And, um, you know, Larry was a really good man, a good fire captain, and we'll miss him. And condolences to the Swafford family. Thank you, sir. Director Jones. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I'd like to say congratulations to all the folks who su successfully um, got on all the l promotional lists, for Captain and Battalion Chief. It's a really big deal, and I'm glad we had such a successful uh, turnout. That's terrific. Um, the visit with uh, Congressman Ami Berra went very well. Thank you to the staff. They had to redo that thing about three times. So uh, our, our, um, okay. our staff, with the lead of Kyle and Aaron, uh, they just did a great job keeping that moving and a very, very positive outcome. So I have my fingers crossed for our possible uh, funding for that EBOP course out there. And lastly, a little something new, but it's old. Uh, the third Saturday in July, July 15th, is the uh, successor to Epi's great race known as the Great American Triathlon. Uh, there's still time to sign up. You can do it iron person or you can do a team. And uh, in the past, we have had several teams representing the different fire department districts. So it might be kind of fun to get up a metro team or two. So I just want to put a pitch into that. You can register at the Great American Triathlon. Okay, so you ready? We'll sign up, Chris. <laughs> Let's go. I'll be on Thank the walking you. part. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Director. Uh, Director Seats. Just a few things. Thank you. Uh, I want to welcome all the new hires and the reserve firefighters. Uh, congratulate, uh, congratulations to all the new 19 candidates for battalion chiefs and uh, uh, the 22 company officer candidates that Matt mentioned. Um, also, Krista, congratulations to her with the CRRD team. Great job. And I just want to wish everybody a safe 4th of July. My apologies for being late. Oh, oh. what? I you made it. Know. We didn't notice. <laughs> you made it really, really quick getting out of that Well, car. I mean, I, I head from headquarters really fast here. <laughs> Thank you, Director. Uh, Director Wood. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just have a couple of quick comments. First of all, I just want to say to the Chief, I just want to give a, a thank you and uh, ask that uh, Brenda Briggs get, and April West get some credit. They did a phenomenal job with the uh, corralling all the parents at the fire camp meeting this week. Looks like a very going to be an exciting time for all the kids because of all the work they put in. So I just want to say thank you for what they've done. 
Um, appreciate the staff and the crew here at 68 letting us come and invade their house. Um, we wouldn't be able to do it without all the work that uh, staff has done, Arthur and the IT division, Metro Cable crew, Marty, all the work you've done, so, and logistics, uh, all, the th all the people that help make this happen. It's a lot of work, but I continue to believe it's important that we get out periodically, spend some time in our houses, and uh, have the doors open so the members of the public can just come in and be a part of this. So I appreciate all the hard work that goes into it. I know it's a lot of work looking around here. I can see all the equipment and things that have to get moved around for this. So thank you for all that you guys have done. And uh, Matt kind of stole my thunder from my, my <laughs> regular me uh, message, but unfortunately, because the way the, the timing happens, we people of the public won't get a chance to hear about the tropical fair, but there's no reason why everyone in this room can't be there on Saturday. I'll be there. I look forward to seeing you all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, uh, Director. Well, we've touched on all the topics pretty much. Um, the only thing I, I would like to... Uh, to ask uh, the public out there is to use safe and sane uh, fireworks on the, on the 4th of July. Uh, let's keep the fires down. Uh, I would like to thank the, uh, the fellows at, uh, at 106, Station 106, uh, C Shift, for inviting me to dinner and uh, having a you know little conversation with them. Pre much appreciated. Uh, I also got an exciting ride, and I invite. Every one of you, and, and thanks to, uh, to uh, Chief House for setting it up at Station 65. I got a chance to ride on the river with the, uh, the rescue boat, and uh, man, those guys are very skilled. They know that river like the back of their hand. Um, we got nothing, and I'm, I include myself because I was hanging out with them. Uh, they gave us nothing but compliments and, and how, you know, how they appreciate the, the crew. And uh, we had some conversations with some fishermen uh, out there, and you know it, it, it was very interesting. We also got a chance to look at the uh, the, the training on the bluffs. Uh, I mean, Metro Fire is so complete that I just I'm just so excited to to have the, uh, the honor to be a board director. <laughs> and um, that's all I have. That's it for that. Next. Uh, Really having no further business. Uh, the next, um, we have a special board meeting, as we mentioned, on the 24th at 8 a.m., a special board meeting the 25th at uh, 1 p.m., and our next regular board meeting is uh, July 13th at 6 p.m. Having no further business, I adjourn this meeting.